Welcome to the third annual Manresa Lecture. I'm Bridget Robertson, president of the amazing Club of the Research Triangle. Tonight, we are here to celebrate transformative thought, Jesuit values, and believing in hope through difficult times. Before kicking things off, allow me a few items of housekeeping. For our live stream guests, please keep your microphones muted throughout the presentation. We will have question and answer at the end. But since we have a large crowd, please use the chat function to submit your questions. The program is being recorded and will be available to watch online afterwards. We're honored to have such a diverse crowd of Hoya friends and family gathered from as far away as Toronto, Lima, San Diego, even Stevensville, Michigan. Hoya is in 18 states, five countries, and of course, our home away from home, Washington, D.C., are all here to be part of this celebration. The Manresa Lecture is now in its third year of connecting Georgetown University alumni clubs worldwide. And through an acclaimed figures lecture, we recognize the positive and transformative impact on our communities. Our awardees push boundaries. They ask difficult questions and they challenge the status quo. Manresa is the town in Spain where St. Ignatius Loyola experienced profound self-discovery and developed the spiritual exercises, which are the foundation of our Jesuit education. The annual lecture is sponsored by the Georgetown University Alumni Association and collectively organized by individual alumni clubs. Those who are gathered in person here tonight are in Durham, North Carolina, at the newest high school within the Cristo Rey Network. The school opened its doors in the fall of 2021 and provides students from families with limited economic means an opportunity to earn a high school degree while gaining professional work experience. Talk about transformative. This is the place. We are grateful to the Cristo Ray Research Triangle High School for hosting us tonight. Let's get things going though, right? To introduce our esteemed awardee, I'm going to ask Fran Buckley to do the honor. Fran is a graduate of the nursing class of 1978 and a parent of two Hoyas in the classes of 2008 and 2012. Fran is many things to many of us here, including nursing advocate, fervent Hoya cheerleader, generous benefactor, and a motherly guide. She was a John Carroll awardee in 2018. And as a side note, it was her prompting and gentle nudge that led me to start the Club of the Research Triangle. And for that, we can all be so grateful. Please welcome Fran Buckley. Our lady tonight has overcome many obstacles in his young life, and all that of so gracious in the cave at Mimosa, Daniel Feigenbaum's story is one of transformation. I know that we have a feeling we need someone, and we just know there's something special about that person. We think he is going to do something great in his life, or so he will make the world a better place. So that is what happened when I met Dave. The great things about Dave from his extended family, we first met him. We don't have their making time exaggerate. But <laughs> in this case, there was no exaggeration. Dave was a great student. He was a talented high school quarterback. He was incredibly driven. And he was also very kind. I was born in the parking lot of his high school, Ravenscroft, here in Mali. So I was getting out of football practice. And I was picking up my sons from Pop Warrior Football. So, as a diligent alumni interviewer, always on the lookout for good potential Georgetown interviews, I just had to say something. Basically, I asked Dave to consider Georgetown for college. Dave loved the idea of going to Georgetown, and the Georgetown Admissions Office and its football program named Dave. So as they say, the rest is history. It is truly a match made in heaven. We have to know that during the journey, we have challenges along the way 
that would really change his life. But as David likes to say, he wanted to put hope into action to conquer his own challenges and to change lives for the better. Then he had his first challenge, his very first week at Georgetown, when he found out his beloved mother, Anne Lee, the Rockingham family, was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. She sadly and gracefully passed away after a reading battle. Interestingly, she called it really the best year of her life because she was surrounded by her loving children. Then turned his grief into action and created a nonprofit organization that served as a forum for college students to express grief called Students of AMF. The acronym AMF stands for Students of Alien Mothers and Fathers. Not coincidentally, AMF are his mother's initials. They mm -hmm. so graduated Robert Kermode with a BS in human science from Georgetown in 2007 and went on to the University of Oxford as an Albertan scholar to complete a two year master's in public health in nine months. From there, he went to medical school at the University of Pennsylvania on a full scholarship. And I am told that magnitude of scholarship is very unusual. While in medical school, they faced personal adversity again. This time, it was his own health at risk. He was diagnosed with the very rare Castleman's disease, which almost took his life numerous times. He will tell you more details about this. But while in medical school, they also decided to get an MBA at Wharton because, well, why not? <laughs> while looking for a cure for his own disease, they saw that fundamental changes needed to be made in the way diseases, drugs, and treatments were researched. And so in 2012, he co founded the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network, which is a collaborative methodology that is transferable to other types of medical research. In 2015, Dave joined the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania and is currently an assistant professor of medicine in translational medicine and human genetics, where he leads a center that's focused on hyperinflammatory diseases. COVID also falls in this category. Most recently, he has co-founded yet another nonprofit organization, and this one is focused on advancing repurposed drug treatments to save lives called Every Cure. Dave has received many recognitions, honors, and awards that are too numerous to mention here tonight, but I will share a few. In 2016, Dave was one of three recipients of the Atlas Award, along with the then Vice President, Joe Biden. He has published research in top medical journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine. Dave has been recognized in the Forbes 30 Under 30 healthcare list. He has been profiled in a cover story in the New York Times, and he has appeared on the Today Show. He is one of the youngest people ever elected as a fellow to the American College of Physicians of Philadelphia, the nation's oldest medical society. Dave has always been a very engaging speaker with a captivating story to tell, and the Georgetown community has benefited from his Dave's speeches over the years. In 2005, Dave gave the news to the convocation speech. In 2017, in 2007, he was the commencement speaker for his NHS class. In 2017, <laughs> the guest commencement speaker for the entire university. Dave's other schools seem to get rid of his speaking. <laughs> and in 2018, Dave addressed the incoming Penn Medical students. And then, just to complete the academic lineup, in 2019, Dave was chosen to be the commencement speaker of his board and graduation. That same year, as he died, in 2019, Dave released his national best selling book, Chasing My Cure Dr. Grace to Turn Hope into Action. And since then, he has, when he's not doing research, he spends a lot of time giving talks all over the country. 
Tonight, it's our turn to listen to Nick. In its short history, the Manresa Award and Lecture has honored Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, Marcia Chaplin and Mary Jordan. But this year, we're pleased to honor Dr. David Fagenbaum for his transformative work in building bridges among medical researchers and for being a tireless advocate in the hunt to cure rare disease. So, as they self appointed Georgetown mom <laughs> and from his hometown of Prague, I am most proud to introduce you to Dr. David Fagenbaum. Oh, what a what a beautiful introduction, and um, it's not just self-appointed Georgetown mom. I, I very much embraced um, a friend as my Georgetown mom, and uh, um, it's such um, wonderful and beautiful words. I, I so appreciate it. Um, you can imagine when I went in for my uh, Georgetown interview for undergrad, and I found out Fran was my interviewer. I was pretty happy about that. I was like, okay, I think I'm gonna be okay. Um, so, uh, so you know, fast forward, and here we are. This is so special, but it's really so wonderful to be with all of you today and see so many friends and, and family um, that are here and others that, that I, I haven't gotten the chance to meet. Um, and to be here, as Fran said, in the, in the Raleigh-Durham area, um, Raleigh uh, and, and Georgetown, these are the two communities that have supported me so much um, during really my most difficult times. Uh, so as, as Fran shared, I, I grew up in Raleigh. Um, uh, with two amazing sisters, Gina and Lisa, who are here with us tonight, um, two amazing parents um, who had immigrated to the U.S. from Trinidad and the Caribbean and, uh, and really drilled into us the importance of commitment to, to, to things of importance and service to others. And um, as, I, as I grew up, um, I really applied that concept of commitment and service to, to football. And uh, commitment to, to training all the time. I had this dream of playing college football and, and service really to my teammates and doing anything I could um, to help the team. And uh, as Fran said, I um, had the opportunity uh, to, to go to Georgetown to play football. And this is a picture of my mom and I on my high school graduation day. Um, this was really, uh, you know, such a, a high point in my life, um, you know, achieving that dream of one day playing college football. I was getting ready to go to Georgetown and then, um, you know, spending time with, with my amazing family um, on that day. Um, sadly, two weeks after, uh, or just a few weeks after this picture was taken, um, was when my mom was diagnosed with brain cancer. And um, that's really when my life was turned upside down, um, to go from this really high point, achieving that, that dream, um, to, to just being devastated. Um, my mom was the, the most amazing person in the whole world, and she taught us so much. And, and, and I love that Fran um, pointed out the one comment that, that my, my mom shared with us about the year of her illness being the best year ever. This is a year she was getting chemotherapy, she was getting radiation, she had multiple surgeries to deal with this horrible form of brain cancer. But because we were all together, because my dad, my sisters and I, we were all with her for that year, um, she called it the best year ever. Um, it's particularly special that we're here in the Durham area because there've been a lot of highs and lows um, in the Durham area here at Duke. Um, at Duke, uh, this is where we came for brain surgery for my mom. And I remember walking um, through the lobby, and, and this is a picture of that lobby, and seeing the sign, at Duke, there is hope. And um, what I'll share a lot about tonight, and, and what um, you would have read if you read Chasing My Cure, um, is that uh, I think there are many forms of hope. There's the kind of hope that you get when you go to Duke and you know you're in the best place in the world for brain cancer, and it can give you confidence um, that you're in the right place and can help you to keep fighting. And there's another kind of hope that I'll talk about a little bit more tonight, where it's the kind of hope that really inspires action. So it's not just, I can feel hopeful about my future, I'm in the right place, but it's that because I'm hoping and because I'm hopeful about the future, I'm gonna take action. Um, but, but of course, I, I really do. I remember looking at that sign and feeling hope and confidence, knowing that we were Duke. And this is a picture of my mom and I, one of the, the last pictures we took together before her passing. Um, and she just you know, always had that amazing smile and uh, you know, touched all of us so much. Um, a, a couple of weeks before my mom's passing, um, I had my last conversation with her and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that's when, uh, she told me that she was worried about, um, about me and my sisters and, and how we would be after her passing. And, um, during that conversation, I told her, mom, I'm going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Um, and I'm going to start something in your memory for other kids like me. And I didn't know what I was talking about. And I said, I'm going to call it AMF. 
I didn't even know what AMF would stand for. Um, but uh, in that moment, my mom loved the idea. And in that moment, thought back to all those years of her teaching me about commitment and service. And she um, spent many weekends and she would drag me kicking and screaming um, to volunteer, whether it was with Special Olympics or a local soup kitchen. Um, and during the week when I was at school, she was doing the exact same things. Um, and, and I think back to, to the, what you taught me around commitment and service. And, and this was really that moment where I could bring it all together. And so um, I continued to play football at Georgetown, but my attention and my drive and my mission shifted from, um, you know, from training for football really to how do I build an organization that can support college students coping with the illness or death of a loved one? And how can I dedicate my career towards a career in medicine where I can help patients like my mom, where I can treat people that have horrible forms of cancer and maybe even be a part of research to develop new forms of, of treatment for them. So um, we started AMF and it was a support group for college students. And we also created a service arm where we would go out and we'd raise money and awareness for important causes. This is one of my, my favorite pictures from an event we, we did. And um, I'm sure there's some of my friends from Georgetown, um, like Ryan Dinsmore and Pete Fisher and, and Liam Grubb and Grant da uh, Greg Davis that are watching and, and Margaret Farland, who's here in person, that would come to these events. And it was just so special to, to raise awareness and raise funding for these important causes. This is one that was actually for brain cancer um, on Capitol Hill. But that Georgetown community being there coming together um, was just so incredible. And as I think about um, St. Ignatius and about this Manresa lecture, and about this commitment to men and women for others. I think that if I was at any other college um, or university in, in the United States, I'm sure that I would have received support from my classmates. I'm sure that um, I would have uh, you know, tried to, to build AMF, but I'm also sure um, that I would not have had the support, not only from the faculty, but also just from my classmates to build AMF into what it became, um, which is now an organization um, that supports college students all over the country. So with my best friend, Ben, uh, who my mom was like a second mom for him, we turned this vision for AMF as a, as a group at Georgetown into a national organization to support college students all over the country. Um, and it's amazing, you know, many years later, AMF continues to support college students today. Um, and along the way, um, we raised a lot of awareness. My, my face was on the back of 40 million bags of Doritos um, for 2007 to 2008. Um, and it was the good kind, it was the Cool Ranch, which is my, which is my favorite one. Um, but it, it was just, you know, really amazing to take, you know, the issue of losing a loved one during college, which is such a challenging experience and to be able to elevate it um, in a way that um, helped to reach people that felt like they were, they were unheard before. I know for me, when I was coping with, with my mom's illness for that first 15 months, um, I thought I was the only person on campus that was dealing with that. And uh, I thought I was completely alone. I felt completely alone until I started AMF and I started learning that actually there were people just down the hall going through similar experiences and being able to connect with one another was really transformative for me. So fast forward um, uh, to my third year of medical school and um, at this stage continuing to run AMF, but now really achieving and, and approaching that dream of treating patients in memory of my mom and uh, getting involved in discovering treatments uh, myself. And um, this is pictures from uh, July of 2010. Um, I was on an OBGYN rotation. I was literally delivering babies, bringing life into this world. Um, again, really at, at, a, at a really high point and always thinking about my mom and thinking about you know, how she would handle some of the challenges that I was facing. Uh, when out of nowhere, I became critically ill myself. Um, so over the course of just a few weeks, all of my organs began to shut down. Um, my liver, my kidneys, my bone marrow, my heart and my lungs all began shutting down. Um, so I went from an OBGYN exam where I took, a, took an exam and I never found out what grade I got on that exam, but I, I suspect that um, Penn uh, gave me a passing grade out of pity. I'm sure I got like a 10 on that exam, but went from my exam down the hall to the emergency department where they ran blood work and revealed that all of my organs were shutting down. So I was admitted to the hospital and then quickly transferred to the intensive care unit where a retinal hemorrhage uh, caused me to be uh, blind in my left eye temporarily, it's, it's now returned. Gained about 70 pounds of fluid because my liver and my kidneys weren't working and drifted in and out of consciousness um, for weeks and weeks without a diagnosis. Uh, I, I think back to, to those moments um, and remember really the lowest moment. Um, and that's when I, I wanted to give up. And I remember, um, 
uh, Lisa and, and Gina and my dad sitting next to me. These are my, my two amazing sisters. And I remember wanting to give up because I was in so much pain. So when you when your organs shut down and you gain fluid everywhere, it causes the, um, the sacs around your vital organs to stretch so much that it feels like you're getting constantly stabbed in, in all of your organs simultaneously. And so with every breath and every movement, it's the most unbearable pain you know you could ever imagine. And there was a point weeks into this where I just wanted to give up, where I just didn't, I didn't have anything left. I'd been fighting for weeks and, and I was ready to slow down my breathing and, and, and truly give up. And um, I remember hearing, uh, hearing Gina's voice saying, just keep breathing, Dave, just keep breathing. And, you know, uh, looking and seeing Lisa and seeing, and seeing Gina next to me, that, that sort of leaning on the people you love in the really tough times is, is so important. And so I kept breathing and, I, and I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, you know, at the time, um, as I thought about giving up, uh, you know, I thought I was giving up on maybe a few more hours of, of hell, frankly. Um, but what I wouldn't have known and, and, and never would have known is I would have been giving up on, on 10 plus years of life and happiness um, and, and, and a lot of health along the way. And so as we think about, you know, challenges that we all face when we feel like we're up against, um, you know, the greatest challenge and there is no hope, there is no future, you know, just keep breathing. And, and most importantly, you know, lean on those people you love, your sisters, your family members, your, your friends, people like Fran, um, uh, you know, just keep fighting. So right around that time, um, uh, I kept getting more and more sick. Uh, and at, at a certain point, um, just down the street at Duke, uh, my doctors explained to my family that I wasn't, I wasn't going to survive. And so um, my family uh, came in, uh, said their goodbyes, and a priest came into my room and read me my last rites. And um, I, I was very sick, so I don't remember much of it, but uh, I do remember being, you know, uh, you know, really scared and just, you know, just uh, devastated that I wouldn't be able to achieve these goals of, of developing drugs in memory of my mom, of, you know, having a family, I'm having kids one day. Um, I do consider that moment to be the start of an overtime. And um, anyone who's a sports fan knows that overtime is different from the rest of the game. So in overtime, every second counts. It's really this time of heightened awareness and, and focus. And uh, ever since I had my last rights read and amazingly have gotten this overtime, I really feel that sense of overtime every day. And, and what I've learned along the way is that really we're, we're all in overtime. And you know, the sense of overtime is the clock's ticking. You don't know how much time you're gonna have, but you gotta make the most of every second. I hope, I hope you all will take that same feeling with you. So um, thankfully, right around that time, the diagnosis was finally made. Idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, a really rare and deadly condition where your immune system attacks and shuts down your vital organs for an unknown cause. Um, at the time, uh, there were no approved treatments, um, but their uh, chemotherapy was, was what's given to try to obliterate your immune system. And so I got a combination of seven different chemotherapies and Thankfully, I survived somehow. Um, as you can see, my dad uh, next to me, uh, my dad never left my side, neither did my sisters. Um, my dad actually spent every single night in the hospital with me for a six month period. So I was in the hospital for six months and, um, and he, was, he was right beside me in, in the pullout um, couch on, in many different hospitals for six months as well, um, really providing amazing support. So um, thanks to chemotherapy, which, which saved my life, I, I began to get better and better. And, and about five months into this, um, it was New Year's Eve of 2010, and I was finally feeling well enough to go for a walk around the hospital. And you can see my head's bald from the chemotherapy. You can see I have a really big belly because my liver and my kidneys weren't working. And as we, uh, you know, I was finally feeling the strength, I wanted to go for a walk around the hospital. It was New Year's Eve. Um, at about 9 p.m., we went on this walk. And as we past the family waiting room, we saw that there was a gentleman who was clearly drunk on New Year's Eve. He was sort of like swaying in his chair. And in our, in our next lap around, we saw that he had fallen onto the ground. And so my dad ran over to him and, and you know, helped him back into his chair. He looked at my dad and I, and he said, thanks so much, good luck to you and your wife. He said, wife, what is he talking about? Then I looked down at my belly and I realized that he thought that I was my dad's pregnant wife. It was a little point emotionally for both of us. Um, um, but we, we managed to laugh really, really hard. And, and that's another thing that we learned, or I've certainly learned along the way, is that during really tough times, laughing with the people you love is so important. I, I can think back to times that Lisa, Jean, and I, in the hospital at Duke, I mean, like weeks since having my last rites read to me, we're watching Borat videos and like, you know, Saturday Night Live on, on YouTube, just trying to find ways to laugh during really tough times. So eventually after about six months, I was discharged and you can kind of see how someone might've thought of me as, as my dad's pregnant wife. And um, 
And then this picture is from a few years before when I played college football at Georgetown. And um, the, I always say these are the worst before and after pictures <laughs> of all time. Um, but if we could flip the order, they could be this, you know, great advertisement, uh, you know, for, for Peloton or Muscle Milk. Um, unfortunately, it, it, it is in the wrong order. Um, uh, just because Margaret's here and she's right in line of sight, I will say that um, uh, one thing that I'm very proud of is that um, uh, Margaret's one of my really close friends. And um, sometime around that picture, uh, around that time, uh, I saw Margaret for the first time over the summer and, and she was like, hey, Dave. And she kind of gave me like a, a punch to the shoulder and, and she broke her wrist. Um, and so I, I really, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I have this like very prideful moment that, you know, she punched me and broke her wrist, punching my shoulder because I was, I was you know, like that. Um, now you can punch me all you want and it's very soft. So, um, so uh, it, it, it's, I'm very forgiving um, these days um, and I embrace the dad bod. But um, so you can see, I took a picture every week for the next eight weeks and um, you can see the fluid going away and, uh, and my hair starting to grow back. Um, and I think I also took pictures from the side too. Yep, so you can see again, the fluid shrinking away um, all thanks to you know, getting this disease under control. So um, when I got out of the hospital, two things kept me going. Um, the first, uh, uh, and both of them are in this picture. The first uh, was Caitlin. So Caitlin and I, I dated for a few years before I got sick and had actually taken a break right before I got sick. But um, when I got out of the hospital, we both um, uh, wanted to get back together and I was so thankful for that. And so um, on one shoulder, I've got Caitlin that's supporting me. And uh, I think that's really representative of what my journey has been like with my sisters and my family and friends supporting me along the way. And on the other shoulder, on my left shoulder in this picture is a, uh, a pump that's pumping an experimental drug uh, into my port. And I, my, my port is a way to to get drug, drugs into my body. And so this experimental drug was the first drug to ever undergo a large clinical trial for Castleman disease. And we all believed this was the drug that was gonna solve the disease. And we'd heard about these incredible cures, other patients around the world were getting this drug and it was saving their life. So, so here I was, I had Caitlin on one shoulder, keeping me going. I had this experimental drug that was gonna be the cure that was gonna keep me in remission. I was able to return to medical school. I see my friend Patrick, who's a classmate and great friend of mine from med school. Um, so happy to be back at med school and, um, and, and really believe that this drug would keep me in remission. Now, this drug was actually um, a, a second generation version of a drug that Kazuo Yoshizaki discovered and developed in Japan. And um, so uh, it's a drug called tocilizumab, which is now used for a lot of different diseases. Um, but I'd heard a rumor that Kazu, that not only had he developed the drug, um, but I had heard that he had given it to himself as the first human ever to get it to prove that it was safe. And I said, Kazu, Makoto just told me that you gave yourself tocilizumab as the first patient ever. And he said, no, 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 I didn't give it to myself. The nurse, the nurse gave it to me. <laughs> said exactly, Kazu. So Kazu discovered, discovered the target for the drug, made the drug, gave it to himself. He didn't die when he gave it to himself. So then he went on to give it to other humans. And now that drug, tocilizumab, is actually the first drug you get if you're admitted to the ICU for COVID. It's a really good drug for suppressing a really hyper-inflammatory immune response made for Castleman's by my, my dear friend, um, Kazu. And, and as you'll hear more of my story, and if you've read Chasing My Cure, you'll know that that sort of sense of self-experimentation and sort of pushing the limits and the boundaries is certainly something that I've, I've very much embraced. Um, unfortunately, despite this experimental drug, um, I relapsed on this treatment and, and nearly died now for the fourth time. Um, and uh, what was so tough about this relapse was, um, was not just that I was relapsing, but as I mentioned earlier, this concept of hope was that all of a sudden I was relapsing on the only drug in development. So now there were no more drugs. There were no more promising leads. This was it. And my doctor explained that to me and um, explained that I would continue to relapse. And uh, it was just a matter of time until I, until I, I didn't survive one of these relapses. And um, I remember turning to Lisa, to Gina, and to my dad and Caitlin, they were all in the room in this hospital in Arkansas. And um, I said, I'm gonna dedicate the rest of my life, however long that may be, to trying to find treatments for this disease. And um, I remember it was, a, it was a somber feeling in that room, but, um, but I knew that however long that may be, um, that I, I would dedicate my life to trying to find a drug for this disease. And this was a really, a, a really big turning point for me. And um, a quote I, I just wanna read from the book is that, this is when I realized that I couldn't just be a hopeful person. I couldn't just go to Duke where at Duke there is hope. I realized that hope cannot be a passive concept. It's a choice and a force. Hoping for something takes more than casting out a wish to the universe. 
and waiting for it to occur. Hope should inspire action. When it does inspire action in medicine and science, that hope can become a reality beyond your water stream. So it's about channeling that hope into deliberate action and, and not hoping and waiting. So for me, that really meant a couple of things. The first is trying to understand what is the research, what's the state of research for Castleman disease right now, and what can we do to change it? And it was worse than I sort of ever could have imagined. Um, I learned that there was no diagnostic criteria, there were no treatment guidelines. That one drug in development was based on the only discovery that had ever been made about how the disease worked. Um, there were no more promising leads. There was no research community. There was no patient community. Um, it was uh, it was frightening um, to see sort of where the field was. Um, and uh, I knew that work had been done for the previous 60 years, and that's where we were. So how could we, you know, at this stage, a group of med students really make a difference against this disease that the medical community hadn't really been able to tackle for 60 years? And so uh, what we decided was to, was to do two things. The first is that we couldn't take the traditional approach uh, that typically is done for research where groups raise money and then invite researchers to apply for that funding. Um, that's the typical way. Uh, and, and when you do that, you're hoping that the right researcher applies for the right project at the right time, which happens if you get hundreds of applicants, but it's unlikely if you get two or three people that are gonna apply for a grant. So we said, we're not gonna do that. Rather than doing that, we're gonna first build a community of physicians, researchers, and patients. Then we're gonna find the most qualified people. And so first build a community, we're gonna crowdsource from the community what are the most important research questions. And then we're gonna go recruit the best people to do it, whether they're Castleman's researchers or not. So really to get away from sort of hoping the right person applies to figure out what is the right study, let's go find the person to do it. So, so that's step one, we're gonna fundamentally change how we're gonna do the research. And secondly, we're gonna have a complete focus on repurposing existing drugs. And the reason that had to be the case is that developing a new drug from scratch takes at least a billion dollars in 10 years to create something from scratch. I didn't have a billion dollars, I didn't have 10 years, right? And so uh, the only chance that I had for survival would be to find an existing drug that could be repurposed to treat my disease. And I knew that was possible because there are many diseases that share the same underlying problems and can be treated with the same drug. I mentioned just a few minutes ago, tocilizumab made for Castleman disease, it's the first drug you get for COVID. So there was sort of the concept behind it and I knew it was my only path forward. And of course there were no guarantees that there was a drug sitting at the pharmacy that could save my life, but I knew if my life was gonna be saved, that was the only way that it could be. So we launched the Castle Disease Collaborative Network to do this, and I began conducting research at Penn. And uh, you know, this concept of repurposing is not something that is unique to medicine. Um, in fact, uh, the first radios were actually intended for ship-to-ship -ship communication, and we now use radio for a lot of different things. The first computers were intended for counting results from the US Census. Um, this sort of concept of finding uh, you know, new uses for existing things is, is, is you know, far beyond medicine. And there are some really great examples within medicine. Um, the drug Viagra, which many of you all are familiar with the primary use is also incredibly life-saving for a really rare pediatric lung disease. Um, drug thalidomide, which you all maybe, maybe have heard of, caused horrible birth defects and was taken off the market about 15 years ago is now the first drug you give to anyone with multiple myeloma, it's a life-saving drug for cancer. And so there's precedent of repurposing outside of medicine, in medicine. And for me, I knew that was my only chance of survival. So as I looked at the pharmacy shelf, the question was which one of these drugs could save my life? And how can I figure out which one of those drugs could potentially save my life? And just to give you guys a bit of a, a scope, um, there are about 3,000 drugs that are approved for about 3,000 human diseases. There's another 9,000 human diseases that don't have a single approved treatment. And so, so the effort that I think is, is more critical than any, any other in medicine is trying to figure out how can those 3,000 existing drugs can be used in new ways to help the three quarters of human diseases that don't have a single approved drug. And in many cases, there's already data that links them. And so um, fortunately over the next year or so, I was able to make a lot of progress scientifically, um, building a community of physicians and researchers and patients, beginning to develop diagnostic criteria and treatment guidelines for Castleman's, um, getting engaged to Caitlin. This is a picture of us on our medical school, on that medical school graduation day. And we got engaged shortly thereafter. Um, and as, as Fran said, um, decided to do an MBA after medical school, because why not? Um, but really it was because um, I really learned during med school, 
that the greatest challenges and roadblocks to progress had nothing to do with medicine or science. They actually were organizational problems. So people weren't collaborating, resources weren't being used efficiently, matching wasn't happening between drugs and diseases. And these were organizational problems. And so I thought um, that it could be useful. And so after medical school, I um, began at Warden. And um, unfortunately, uh, just a few months later, um, relapsed and uh, nearly died for the fifth time. And what was so tough about this relapse was that I was getting weekly chemotherapy to try to prevent the relapse. And I still relapsed on weekly chemo. Um, that picture is actually from Caitlin and I's engagement party that's at Fran's house. Um, at, shortly after, I spent a month in the hospital um, in critical condition, chemo saved my life again. I, I should mention it's a combination of seven chemotherapies that I've gotten. Um, it worked, saved my life. Um, Shortly thereafter, we celebrated at, at Fran's house for our engagement. Um, but right before this picture was taken and right afterwards, um, I was uh, basically 24 seven in a lab trying to find a drug um, that could maybe save my life. I knew that I wouldn't make it to our wedding day unless I could find a drug to keep this disease in remission. So um, I, I tried to keep the science somewhat light in here, but I, I will say, just wanna share a couple slides that sort of gets to how I went from that sick person who you know, wanted to marry Caitlin to, to where I am today. And that's that I performed a series of experiments on my own immune cells, on my own blood cells. Um, I'd been storing them every couple of weeks leading up to that last relapse. And so now I could take them out of the freezer. Um, I could also reach out to hospitals that had samples stored. Remember from the hospital, um, uh, Gina, Lisa and I on the phone, or had them on the phone because I was too weak and tired, calling hospitals, trying to get all the samples centralized to Philadelphia. So when I got back to Philadelphia, the samples would be would be in place. And so got all that in place and um, uh, went to work and ended up um, uncovering a few parts of my immune system that seemed to be off. Um, uh, parts of my immune system that I thought that maybe we could target with a drug. So um, those were, uh, the, we uncovered a number of what are called cytokines, which are inflammatory proteins um, that your immune cells use to communicate one, with one another that were very elevated. Um, a growth factor called vascular endothelial growth factor was elevated. And then your, my immune cells called T cells, which are really like your killer immune cells. They, they sort of do the most damage in your body in a good way, but also potentially in a bad way. They were highly activated, like out of control activated. And so the question became, is there something that connects all of them? Is there something we can hit with a drug that will diffuse this whole problem and prevent it from happening again. And so did some more work, um, some follow-up studies, and um, it uncovered that a part of the immune system called the mTOR signaling pathway, um, which is a really important communication line, seemed to be turned into hyperdrive, into overdrive. And so um, that there was a sort of a hint of that. But then I did a final experiment that was um, you know, really simple, but, um, but really uh, you know, life-changing for me. And that's where I tested a bunch of lymph nodes and your lymph nodes are where your immune cells go to communicate with one another. It's sort of the, the home base for your immune system. So I tested a bunch of normal lymph nodes to see how much mTOR is turned on, how much is this communication line turned on. And in this particular study, um, cells that are blue have, are negative for this communication line and cells that are brown are positive. So you can see in, in a representative normal lymph node, there are some cells that are brown, some cells have this communication line turned on, but most cells are blue, most cells have it turned off. And then we stay in my lymph node and I was just blown away by the tremendous amount of activation of this communication line. It really um, was just you know, right in my face. Okay, we thought it was turned on, now we have it sort of in black and white um, that it truly is. And the reason this was so transformative is that 50 years ago on the island of Rapa Nui in the Pacific, some researchers were digging in the soil, literally on the beach and uh, they took the samples back to the US and they found within the soil of Rapa Nui, a compound um, that got named rapamycin or rapamune that is really good at inhibiting mTOR. Like it's it, the thing that I just showed that was really high, this drug turns that thing off um, in a really, really impressive way. And so all of a sudden we had this thing that seemed to be turned on in my immune system and seemed to be responsible possibly for what was going on. And now you have a drug that's really good at inhibiting it. Um, and at this stage, I was out of other options. And so um, I shared the data with, with my doctors and um, uh, we all agreed that in the absence of other options, you know, maybe we should try this inhibitor of mTOR and maybe see you know, if this could actually work for me. And um, so today marks 108.81 months that I've been in remission. And so you don't have to do, oh, thank you. Um, 
So, so you don't have to do the math. That's a little bit over nine years. I, I celebrated nine years on January 5th. Um, but I, I, I don't like to say it's been a little bit over nine years because every fraction of a week, a month, a day, a year means a lot to me. And so it's 108.81 months is, is how long I've been in remission tomorrow to be 0.84 months. And um, it's, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it, you know, you can even look at the graph. I, I don't think I ever imagined it could have gone this high, right? You know, um, but, but, you know, it really does feel like a dream. And as I think back to um, the moments when I wanted to give up, when I didn't want to, you know, I, I couldn't bear the pain any longer. Um, again, I would have never known what I was giving up on, um, but I'm just so thankful that I didn't. Um, the New York Times called this doctor cure thyself, which I think is a bit of an overstatement. I think it should be doctor helping himself a little bit right now and hopefully for a lot longer, um, but I don't think that that would have fit. Um, importantly, um, Caitlin and I made it to our wedding day, May 24th, 2014. Um, and my hair grew back just in time. That's never before been cut hair that's in that picture, um, which is actually pretty important to me. I, I, um, I didn't want the external reminder on my wedding day for Caitlin of sort of what I'd just been through and what I likely would continue to put her through. Um, and so it came back just in time. Um, and then four years ago, we had our first child, sweet Amelia. Um, you can see um, in this picture uh, from when she was about one year old. And then um, just a year ago, we had our second second child, baby David. Um, and so, yeah, it just it just feels like such a dream. Um, never could have imagined uh, that you know I'm here with you all today and uh, have the opportunity to share my story and to and to think about uh, you know this amazing family. Um, I was told by Caitlin that she likely would not be watching on video because she'll probably be laying on the floor next to Amelia's bed while she's trying to get Amelia to sleep. So probably Caitlin is probably not watching, but uh, uh, hopefully Amelia is sleeping. So um, you can imagine um, that once this drug started helping me, we started thinking how many other patients could this drug help? And so one of the first patients we treated uh, was Katie and she's been doing well for many years and Deepa and Clara and Joseph and Jacob and uh, many others have benefited uh, from serolimus. The next picture is from Kayla. Um, Kayla did not respond to serolimus. Um, so we went on another journey and we ended up identifying a different drug called ruxolidinib that had also never been used before for Castleman disease. Um, but she became the first patient ever um, treated with that drug and she's doing great. She just passed two years that she's been in remission. And so I, I should have also mentioned with my drug, um, the reason that I could take it is because it was already approved for kidney transplantation. So it had been studied and, and work had been done to get it approved. And this is on the shelf. And then we could take it off the shelf and try it for Castleman's. Same thing with ruxolidinib. It was approved and developed for a form of cancer called myofibrosis. And then we were able to give it to Kyla. Um, another experience, an example of repurposing is with my uncle, Michael, um, who maybe uncle Michael is watching um, today. Uh, Michael was diagnosed with metastatic angiosarcoma a little bit over six years ago and um, was given a death sentence uh, just down the street at Duke. You know, his, his doctors explained, you've got three to six months to live and, um, and metastatic angiosarcoma, no one survives it. And um, uh, I just finished um, working with a company that had a really cool drug that, uh, looked really promising in the cancer space. And, and so uh, we ended up testing his tumor to see if maybe it would be susceptible to that drug. And um, just sort of the concept of thinking outside the box, um, uh, Michael's doctor was completely opposed to the idea. He said, you know, your uncle's gonna die in the next few months. Um, nothing's gonna work for his cancer. And um, uh, it's just gonna be a waste of time to do the study. And um, even if it might work, the drugs are really expensive, so it's a waste of time. Don't do it. So we did the study anyway. Of course, we didn't. We didn't listen to the doctor. Um, but we did it, and it came back blazingly positive. Um, Ninety-nine percent positive. Ninety-nine percent of the cells um, express what's called PDL1, and um, he became the first patient ever with any form of angiosarcoma to be treated with a PD1 inhibitor called Keytruda, and he's doing great. And it's been over six years. He lives in South Carolina and um, plays golf every day, love and life, and he's. Uh, uh, and so, and now there's patients all over the world that are treated with PD-1 inhibitors for angiosarcoma. Um, and uh, it, all it took was, um, was just doing a simple stain, it cost like $18 for us to do it. And um, his life, you know, has been completely altered and, and patients with angiosarcoma's lives have been altered. And so, you know, what I hope you get from this is that that took like no level of brilliance or intellect or anything just to say, let's try it. Like the drug's already there. You've already made the drug. It, it's really good. If you have this one thing, the drug is really good. 
let's figure out if you have this one thing. And just because no one with this cancer has ever been treated with it doesn't mean that it's not gonna work. It just means no one's ever been treated with it. So, you know, as you look at the shelf, I think that, you know, when I see a pharmacy shelf, I have this incredible amount of hope and excitement about like, well, what else can these drugs be used for? And um, I think it's important um, when you're framing sort of the excitement around, you know, what could be on the pharmacy shelf is to understand why aren't drugs currently being fully utilized. And it's not because there's an evil group of people who wanna hold drugs back and prevent lives from being saved. It has nothing to do with that. Um, it really has to do with the system that we have and, and incentives within our system. So, so first off, there is no business model for drugs that are already generic to be repurposed, meaning that no one can afford to spend money on doing a clinical trial if they will make no money from doing that clinical trial. If the drug is generic, by definition, no one makes money off of that drug. Almost 90% of all drugs are generic. So now 90% of our armamentarium is now off the table for figuring out new uses for those drugs because no one can profit from those drugs. So that's not good, right? So there's no business model if the drug's generic. If the drug is not yet generic, it's gonna be generic at some point soon. And so there's already math happening um, in terms of, do I wanna spend the tens of millions of dollars on a trial if I only have a couple of years of patent life by the time I prove that it works? And clinical trials are expensive so the, and the math doesn't add up. And so that's one part, no business model. Second is that there's no centralized data repository of what drugs are approved for and what drugs might be useful for. You know, what are the things like the serolimus for Castleman's or, or um, pembrolizumab for, for angiosarcoma that maybe could benefit? There's, it's not in one place. So researchers like me and others, we do the same work over and over and over again. And if I find something that looks promising for a disease that I don't study, that's sort of pushed to the side while I look at the disease that I do study. So, so there's no central database. And third, there's no entity in the whole system that's responsible for figuring out more uses for all drugs. The FDA is responsible for saying yes or no when pharmaceutical companies present data to them. Pharmaceutical companies are responsible for making profit for their shareholders by developing drugs. Um, they are not responsible for figuring out all uses for their drugs. So there's this massive gap in the system where what I would think would be like the most important thing in all of medicine is that you develop a drug, it's at the pharmacy, it's being manufactured. There's no one that's responsible for tipping it over the edge and getting it across the finish line for new uses. And so um, uh, we, we were very fortunate to work really closely with a number of folks at FDA, but this is a, an important quote from one of our colleagues there about how sadly, once drugs are approved, there's diminishing incentives to figure out more uses for those drugs. And so our colleagues at FDA are devastated that, you know, that, you know, that they don't have more opportunities to approve drugs for more diseases, but they can't do it unless the trials are done. And so um, uh, nothing existed until this fall and um, had the opportunity to launch a nonprofit organization along with a good friend of ours from medical school, Grant Mitchell, um, called Every Cure. And so Every Cure is on a mission to unlock the full potential of every approved drug to treat every disease and every patient possible. And the way we do that is through building a central database so to address this issue of lack of a database of listing all drugs, the diseases they may treat, the diseases they do treat, and leveraging incredible new technologies. In fact, with a group at, at UNC just down the street at the Renzi Renaissance Computing Institute to leverage the world's knowledge to figure out new uses for drugs and to work really close to pharmaceutical companies because a lot of companies and individuals within pharmaceutical companies are excited about more uses for their drugs, but the math just doesn't add up to actually do the trials to prove it out. So what we're excited about is to be that partner to large pharmaceutical companies where they say, I really think serolimus could be used for this use. We're not going to fund it, but we want you to do it, and, and we will happily embrace doing it. So one part's the data play. The next part's actually doing the clinical trials. And so when we identify a drug that looks promising for a disease, we want to do the trial so that you don't have to you know, do the work in, your, in a lab or to, you know, to you know, do a test to find a drug for your uncle. When we find these promising drugs, we'll actually raise the funds to do the clinical trials to prove they work really replacing um, the job of the pharmaceutical company, but to get, make sure that patients get these drugs. And so um, since we announced in September um, the launch of Every Cure, um, we have had so many patients and families reach out to us expressing um, you know, and, and requesting, can we help them? And so of course, we're doing everything we can. We haven't fully built out the team or the data engine, but we do have access to a bunch of data. And so we're using the data that we do have um, to really piecemeal anything that we can. And so this is a young patient um, named Baker, a young, young boy um, who's really 
had been struggling since birth with, with a rare immune condition. And leveraging the data that we have, we were able to identify a drug that could be helpful for Baker. Um, it was able to help him get out of the ICU, get home for a few days. Um, unfortunately, uh, Baker passed away about a month ago. Um, but it's patients like Baker and experiences like this that are really driving us to say, this was a drug that was at their pharmacy that was able to help Baker, help get him out of the ICU, spend some time at home with his family um, that was not going to be given to Baker if not for this discovery that we made in the lab. It wasn't enough, obviously. You know, we, we did not do enough. Um, but this is the drive that we have is to say, we proved that this thing could be helpful for him. You know, what would have, what would have gotten him back to the, the normal life that Baker deserves? And, and could there have been a drug? And maybe there isn't another drug, but maybe there is. And you know the belief in why we call ourselves why we call ourselves every cure is the belief is that every patient that has a disease that could benefit from a drug that's at their pharmacy deserves to benefit from that drug. So we're very much on the road these days, um, raising awareness and funds and looking for partners for every cure. And so I really hope you all will check out everycure.org to learn more about this mission that we're on. If there's someone in your in your realm, whether it's someone you work with or some or an organization that you think might be interested, pharmaceutical companies, CROs, data science companies that you think might be interested, please do send them our way. We are we are on a mission. We are on a, a crusade to unlock every use of every drug, um, but we can't do it alone. And so I hope you guys will please uh, please connect with us. And um, and actually along the way. Um, uh, we found a really great partner in all of this. Um, President Clinton um, read Chasing My Cure about a year and a half ago, and I got a text the day before April Fool's Day, said, hey, I'm President Clinton's chief of staff. He wants to talk to you. And I just assumed it was April Fool's Day. And so I was like, it's a joke. Maybe it was Patrick. Um, so I didn't respond, but then he called. And he said, no, really, he wants to talk to you. So anyway, I uh, spoke to President Clinton for about, a, about an hour, um, about a year and a half ago, and uh, he was just so blown away by um, uh, by the potential for repurposing drugs and the fact that it wasn't being tapped. And so um, he's become an incredible partner. He, he checks in every couple of months and gave us the opportunity to announce every cure at the Clinton Global Initiative as, as, the, um, as, the, as the lead presentation. And so um, it's amazing to have a partner um, like President Clinton in this, and uh, we're looking for others that wanna join us in, in really uh, this very transformative way. And I know I'm way over time, so I'm gonna summarize my, my final lessons um, very briefly, and, and I've got five of them for you. So the first I, I mentioned earlier is um, that I've lived my life as though I've been in overtime ever since November of 2010. Um, but I've also learned along the way that we're all in overtime. Um, sadly, losing uh, my, my dear brother-in-law, uh, Chris, to ALS um, just a couple of years ago, um, and, and others along the way realizing that we really are all in overtime. We have to make the most of every second. The second is that my life changed when I went from just being a hopeful person to being someone that turns my hope into action. And so I think it's really important that we reflect on what are we hoping for, what are we praying for? What are we wishing for? And then say, what can I do today, tomorrow, and the next day to get closer to the thing that I'm hoping for? Third is that I hope no one in this room is ever confused as your father's pregnant wife. But if you are, I hope you can find some humor in that and all of life's challenges. You know, we've really found that laughing in the midst of tough times can be so, so powerful. The fourth is that solutions can often be hiding in plain sight. The drug that is literally saving my life. I'm here right now because of a drug that was on the pharmacy shelf that no one knew could be, be life-saving for me. How many more solutions are hiding in plain sight? And the last thing I want to uh, leave you all with is that my book is called Chasing My Cure, uh, but we really, and I hope it's come across during this talk, we really should have called it Chasing Our Cures because it's been such a team effort with so many people that have been a part of this. And so I encourage and hope you all will become a part of chasing our cures. So whether it's getting involved with every cure in some way, or whether it's helping to spread the word about our message of hope, um, but I really hope you'll be a part of this army. So thank you all so much. I've left very little time for questions, but I'm delighted to stay here as long as you guys want. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much for your, your message. The research you're doing, you continue to do, and your message is putting forth the action. That is uh, fantastic. I think by the time we'll have like, one online question, and maybe one here in the room. Um, and one of the first ones that, that comes about online um, is asking about from the patient side. 
Uh, and if you're a person in the middle of Ohio, the diagnosis like some of your patients, how do you get access to a doctor that has your, your vision, your uh, outlook? Yeah, great question. So the first thing is, um, is to reach out online. So, you know, look online, find the organization for your disease, reach out to them. Um, if you have Castleman disease, you'll reach out to the CDCN. Um, we'll connect actually with your doctor locally. And so we can support your doctor locally. But I really do recommend when you have a rare disease and don't know what to do, find out who the expert is and just like get in your car and just drive, just go to, go to the expert. It's so, so important. Yeah, great question. So there are some theories in particular, you know, recently um, it's become clear that a horrible autoimmune disease called MS, multiple sclerosis, is triggered by EBV infection. And so that's pretty um, been well, well defined just in the last year or so. Um, a, a lot of these are still to be determined. The disease I have is called idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease. Idiopathic means you don't know the cause. So we, we're still trying to figure out what is it that triggers it. Um, but uh, fortunately for a lot of these diseases, there are drugs that can control them well. Any others? Okay. I just have a question with your um, being in remission. Was it a one-time dose of this drug and everything from there has been great or do you need repeated? Three pills a day and I will keep doing three pills a day for as long as it works. And yeah, sometimes you ask like, so are you, you know, when are you going to stop and see what happens? Like never, <laughs> never. I'm going to take these three pills every day for as long as I can. Any uh, how do insurance companies fit in? Like you're finding generic you know, drugs, how do you get the insurance companies on board? Great. Yeah, great question. So yeah, how do you make sure that the ideas you find are actually reimbursed? And so um, when drugs are generic and cheap, insurance companies really rarely balk. They're just sort of, you know, sure. Um, if the drug is expensive and it's got very little data behind it, you have to make a really strong case. Um, and that's where, you know, you need to bring in data, you need to show uh, hopefully other experiences where that drug has been used. Um, but it's, it's really tough when there's, when there's limited data insurance companies. I, I mean, and the one sort of secret is that um, insurance companies almost always start out with no, and there's almost always a path to yes. There's not always a path to yes, but with enough haggling, with enough calls, oftentimes you can get to yes. But that sort of highlights, you know, discrepancy or an issue we have in, in our country where like you need to find a doctor who's able to make, you know, 17 phone calls to an insurance company and doctors don't have time to make 17 phone calls for one patient for one drug to an insurance company. And so it's, it's a real challenge. So follow up to that, Washington Post in the last few days had their uh, science writer write about a person who she had with her son who has a rare disease, who's three. And um, sort of what you said, she said the most crucial part for her getting a drug for her son was finding a physician who knew how to describe to the insurance company the importance of this expensive drug because nothing else worked. Um, and that's pretty much what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. You, and that's, that's where I was saying, you know, if you have a rare disease and you just, who's the expert? Get in your car and just go. Um, I remember, you know, Little Rock, Arkansas is where the expert is for Castleman disease. And, um, uh, Everyone that I'd seen at Duke and at Penn uh, and UNC, they struggled to come up with a diagnosis of what I had. And then we got to Little Rock, Arkansas. And I remember we got in the shuttle to go to the hotel. And um, my dad and I are getting in the shuttle. And, and the shuttle driver was like, Oh, do you have Castleman disease? Like, <laughs> the shuttle driver knows I've got Castleman disease, like Duke and Penn. You know, so, and the shuttle driver recognized because I, mean, I had all this fluid on me, and a lot of Castleman's patients have these big bellies. And it's like, yeah, I, I have Castleman, you know, I wish you could have, you know, visited me at Penn, um, in a console. Um, but yeah, so I think, and that's why you want to go to the place, right? They've seen so many Castleman's patients in Little Rock, Arkansas, the shuttle driver, you know, knows how to pick it up. And, that, and that's where you want to be if you have a rare disease. And now that's kind of how Philadelphia is. Well, thank you, David, for leading us in inspirational conversation. Thank you. And we're proud to have you over here in the next election. Thank you. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed that idea and that uh, turning hope into action. Very lovely, uplifting message. We wish you great health and success. Um, I'd like to present you with a little uh, token of our appreciation. Uh, we have an official 
Man, raise that award. I love it. Thank you. Oh, I see it. It's just it's beautiful. Thank you. And, and a big round of applause for Brett for organizing it. Well, at this point, we have uh, wrapped up our third men race election. I hope you'll join me in turning our attention to the Club of Metro Washington, D.C., who will be our host for the fourth men race election. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Thank you, everyone online, for tuning in. Have a good evening, and hoya sa. Bye. Bye.